recording. All right. So I'm starting to record the lecture now. I still fail, so. All right. So the first thing I'm going to do is to explain the solution of the lab on Tuesday just a little bit. I finished grading it. Mm, unfortunately, not everybody got your perfect score, which I was kind of hoping for. But that's okay. You know, I'm just going to explain it, and hopefully that helps people to understand you know, conditional branches and how to do, um, you know, basically how to specify the logic of a program. All right, so I'm, gonna, I'm, I'm just going to start with a blank file, okay? Uh, I'll call this TTP, abs.ttpasm. Oops, got too much. There we go. All right, so the first instruction is a no-op instruction in your code. That is not necessary because, as you can see, no-op does not do a single thing. However, you know, later on when we start to use a, a tracing tool, that becomes necessary, okay? So I just want to get people to get used to, oh, okay, I start every program with a no-op because, you know, I want to train you guys to kind of have this, this habit. <clears throat> and then we have a, a label, you know, K1 or whatever number that is, I think it's just K1 for constant one. And this is a, a label definition that specifies a particular value. So you can actually attach a value to it. Otherwise, you know, a label is really just the symbolic name of the location of the next you know, instruction or the next opcode or the next byte or whatever. So in this case, you know, I can give it like you know 190. Okay. So 190 is just specifying the bit pattern that would otherwise be representing 190. But it's just a bit pattern, which means you know it can be interpreted fine, it can be interpreted interpreted unsigned and so on. Um, and then we start with uh, and a uh, LDI a with uh, K1. So the only reason why I introduce K1 is I can use a script to look for the definition of K1 and then change that line when I'm testing your code. So that gives me you know, it gives my script an anchoring point so I can change the constant that I load into register A. I probably can do the same thing by looking for LDIA comma or something, but looking for a label is a little bit easier. And then we do the AND AA. Now, this is starting to, so if I were to you know, document the program, this is the same thing as just you know, saying, okay, assignment statement, register A gets the value of K1. This one here is a little bit more mysterious because there's nothing happening to register A. It remains in the same value as before. But what we're doing here is to push register A, I shouldn't say use the word push, because I'm gonna use push in a very specific context in today's lecture. So I'm just gonna say, you know, register A or the value of register A goes through the ALU. And the purpose of doing this is to set the two, one of the two flags that are always gonna be affected when you have that operation. Other than increment and decrement, increment and decrement are by design not going to change the flag register. So in this case, um, I need to know whether the number is, or what the value in register A is when interpreted signed is negative or not, okay? So there's only one bit of the entire 8-bit pattern that can tell me whether the number is negative or non-negative. That would be the sign the signed bit, which is the most significant bit. Is that okay so far? All right? <clears throat> and that part really has to do with you know, how we compute the signed interpreted value of a bit pattern, because the signed bit is responsible for you know, determining are we subtracting you know, two to the power of you know, the, the highest exponent of an A bit number, that would be bit seven. So that's why you know, we use a JSI at this point to see if the sign bit is a one. If it is a one, I go to a particular label, let's call it L L1. If not, so if I'm here, that means the sign flag is a zero. If the sign flag is a zero, that means the, the okay, that means VS um, register A, A bits is going to be non-negative. It is greater than or equal to zero. So that means I don't have a dual thing. I don't have anything to do here because the whole program is supposed to find the absolute value of register A. Is that okay? So a few people, I know people working groups, <laughs> so when, when I spot a problem, 
you'll sometimes you'll like a group of people get exactly the same problem. It is okay with the labs. If I see something like this in the exams, there will be some consequences. Okay, but for the labs, it's okay. Okay, you know, I do want people to actually talk to each other during the lab. But a bunch of people put the uh, two's complement code, you know, right uh, here. Okay, which is the wrong spot to do it because this branch is representing what happens when <coughs> register A has a signed value that is non-negative. There's nothing to be done here. So that means you know, if I define L1 over here, this is where we need to put some code here. So this is where we need to perform two's complement, which is first negating the value of register A in a bitwise sense. So the instruction to do that is not A, because you know, this is doing the same thing as A equals to the tilde of A, which is the bitwise not of A, otherwise known as one's complement. So if I want to document this in yet another way, this is saying that A is the one's complement of A itself. But we want to perform two's complement, okay? Because one's complement does not give you the arithmetically negative value. It just gives you the bitwise not of the original bit pattern. So that means I have to add one. Now, if you want to add one, this does not work because it expects two registers, okay? The add instruction expects two registers because according to the opcode table, it is x, y. x has to be a register, y also has to be a register. Okay, so there's, this does not work. Um, there are a few ways to do this. If you want to use another register, you could do something like this. Okay, that would work. Because I just put a constant of one into register B and then I add register B to register A, therefore accomplishing you know, incrementing register A. But you don't have to do it like this because in the lab, in the very same lab, I also introduced the increment instruction which does exactly the same thing. So in this case, A is A plus one. So that means you know, this is the last instruction for me to execute in order to um, finish the two's complement operation. So that's the correct answer. So there are a few interesting things that I observed. Uh, a group of people put semicolons after the instruction that would not have assembled. So next time, make sure it assembles before you turn in your code. Because according to the syllabus, code that does not assemble will automatically get a zero. Okay, I did not go that strict this time, okay, but I will. So make sure it assembles. All right, so this is the solution of the <coughs> homework assignment, yes. Um, I actually did not use a tester code. I, this time I actually just you know, locate the code and I did, I did all the testing in my head. <laughs> but if you want to test your code, there are only two possible cases that you need to worry about. Is you, know, you have to use a value here that is at least 128, therefore making the most significant bit or the sign bit being a one. Um, you cannot use 128 because 128 does not can negative 128 can be represented, but positive 128 cannot be represented using only eight bits. So you have to use the 129 and above to specify a value that is negative, and then you use a value from zero to 127 to represent a value that is non-negative. So those are the only two test cases that you have to go through. But with those test cases, you can actually use just use logic you know, for that purpose and figure out you know, whether the code is doing the right thing or not. All right, so do we have any questions about this particular program? It is not by any means a very simple program because you have to understand a few key concepts that, are, that were new on Tuesday. Okay, the first one is using the AND AA instruction as quote unquote a test instruction. In other words, we are simply you know, forcing register A or the value, the bit pattern of register A through the ALU so that we can set the one flag that we need, which is the sign flag. It will also change the Z flag, but we don't care about the Z flag in this case, so we just go like, eh, okay, you know, we're just ignoring that. And we are using the sign flag, you know, JSI, to determine, okay, is the sign flag set? Because if the sign flag is set, then we have a negative value and we need to negate it. 
we need to arithmetically negate it, which is what lines nine and 10 are doing. So that's you know, kind of important. Uh, the other part is line nine and 10. You know, that's basically a combination between what we are learning right now and what we have already learned when we talked about you know, signed versus unsigned representation you know, with uh, big power. So that's kind of, you know, so this program is by design, try to tie in as many things as possible, you know, including things that we have talked about some time ago. Are we doing okay so far with this program? Are there any questions that you want to ask? Yes. This is for the lab on Tuesday. So that's the one where we have to uh, write the code. Yeah. 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 You have to write the code. Yep. The entire lab on Tuesday is the construction of this program. It started off with you know trying to figure out which opcode is hijacked and stuff like that, because you know um, because or AA is actually hijacked. If you are to say or AA. It doesn't do what what, what or AA you know, suggests. Uh, compare AA, CMP AA also does not do what it is you know, suggesting because it is also hijacked. So those two are hijacked in order to implement increment and decrement. All right. So any other questions about this program? The point value of you know the part that you have to turn in is four points. Okay. So four points out of a total of 11 points seems like a lot, but if you look at it out of all of the lab you know, activities that we do in this class, it is not that much. Um, and a few people did not even turn in anything for the file submission part. So I cannot say anything about that, okay. So do we have any other questions about this program? We good, okay. So I would say this program reflects the kind of complexity, kind of you know, concept, concept that we need to use from here on, okay? You know, which means you, know, you need to be familiar with all the instructions to begin with. And then we are going to start to talk about how we combine these instructions to do things that are meaningful. So that's kind of where we are heading right now, okay? Just want to give everybody a context of you know, where we stand in this class. All right, so with this done, okay, you know, because I, I graded the, uh, the lab today and I spotted a few things I go like, ah, I might want to talk about it in the class. So that's basically what I'm doing here. Oh, also, a few people, instead of using the JSI instruction, you'll know, use the JSL instead. So that would also be a typo. The program would not have assembled and if I were to follow my, you know, syllabus strictly, that would, you know, those submissions would have received a zero instead of one or two or three points, depending on, you know, how the rest of the program is written. All right. Are we okay with this? So every time you turn in your code, make sure that the code assembles. How can you make sure the code assembles? Put it, put it through the assembler, okay? It's not a lot of work. It's basically just copy, paste, wait a little bit and see if there, there are error messages. All right, so what we're gonna do now is to continue to talk about a new topic. So the new topic is you know, how do we call and return from a function? So this is the uh, whole thing, you know, I made some adjustments, you know, I added some content to this whole thing. So this is calling and returning from a function. So there we go. So the first thing we'll do is to go through an example. Okay, this is a C program example. Let me kind of zoom in a little bit. So this is the program that I want you guys to take a look at. Okay, and what does it do? Well, the answer is absolutely not. Right, because you know, we call f, and what does f do? Nothing. It does not return a value, nor does it do anything actually inside the function. But I called it twice. So the question is, what mechanism do we use in order to implement this particular C code? In other words, okay, going from main to go to f the first time, 
that's an easy. We got a JMPI instruction. So as long as F as a function has a label as the entry point, it's pretty easy to do. Okay, a JMPI can get the job done. When F is done, it has to go back to the to the program, go back to the caller. In other words, it has to continue execution over here. So you go like, oh, we can use another JMPI instruction. Well, that won't work because the second time when we call F, it has to return to another location, which is this location here. So going to a subroutine when you're calling the subroutine, we can use the JMPI because the destination is always at the same place as long as you're calling the same function. But to return from a function, it's like, hmm, we need to return to a different spot depending on where you're calling the function to begin with. So now we have this little mystery of going like, but how do we manage that? How, how, does, how can the computer know where to go back to depending on where it was called to begin with? Okay, so that's kind of the mystery that we want to solve in today's class. Are there any questions about what I just said? Okay, yes. The question was, how does a function know where to return to? Because where it returns to depends on where it is called from. Like this particular invocation or call has to return to the second line of main. But the second invocation or the second call from main has to return to the third line of main. So how does the function, the function being called, know that, oh, I need to go back to that location this time? And how do we handle recursion? Because recursion is a function calling itself. Okay, so how does it know where to go back to when it is being called from itself? Okay, so there are a few mysteries that we are trying to solve in today's class. All right, so moving on to a digression to the stack, okay, the concept of a stack. So a stack is a data structure that enforces the LIFO, LIFO, last in, first out order. In the abstract sense, a stack starts empty and will denote that with just open and you know, close your brackets. If there are items on the stack, the leftmost item is called the top of the stack. Okay, that's awfully abstract, okay? So what I want you guys to think of, you're going to a buffet restaurant. You go like, buffet restaurant, okay. And by the way, you know, there's a really good one, you know, you know it's on Sunrise, you know, I go there fairly often now. Lunch is only 15 bucks. It is all you can eat, and they got fairly good food too. But I'm not gonna name the restaurant because I, they, they, they didn't pay me to do that. <laughs> <laughs> But anyway, at a buffet place, you know, how do you get a plate? You're not going to wait for the waiter or the waitress you know, to come to you and go like, oh, here's a, here's a clean plate for you to start the next run to the food, right? <coughs> so instead, they have a stack of dishes, okay? So if you have observed you know, people working in a buffet restaurant, you will know that, oh, okay, when they got clean dishes out of the kitchen, they just kind of put it onto the spring-loaded stack of dishes. So that means you know, the very first dish that they put on the stack in the morning or you know, whenever they open is going to be the last one to, that got retrieved by customers. Okay, The very first one, hot from the kitchen, is the first one that get retrieved. Sometimes it's burning hot also because they use you know, hot water to wash the, to wash, to wash the dishes. So that is that. That is what I mean when I said last in, first out. Another example of a last in, first out, you know, kind of retrieval order is when you load up a U-Haul truck. I'm sure most of you have either moved or have helped somebody move using a U-Haul truck, okay? So let's just say the U-Haul truck is really filled up and you, you know, the last item is a bicycle, okay? You, you push the bicycle in and before it falls off the truck, you slam the tailgate down, okay? And then unfortunately, you're helping that person to move in San Francisco, where there are steep slopes, okay? And you have to, you have to park the truck you're facing up on the slope. You open the tailgate, the very last item that you push in is the first thing that is falling out of the truck, followed by your file cabinets and other heavy items. So you just have to stay out of the way and let it fall out 
on his own. Does that make sense? Third example of last in, first out, which is not the way it should be, but that's the way the, the appliance is designed to do. Refrigerator, okay? So we, we stock up the refrigerator with all the good stuff, okay? Cheese, milk, and all kinds of good stuff, okay? So most of the time when you open the fridge, it's like, I'm hungry, let me go get something to eat. You don't really go all the way to the far end of the, of the fridge. You just look at the front end of the fridge and go like, okay, this is what I want, okay? So you grab something, you, you, you pour it out, or you take some of it and you put it back in the fridge. What happened to all the stuff in the back of the fridge? Eventually, it becomes a mold garden with all the fantastic colors like purple, green, orange, okay? All the colors that your food is not supposed to look like, right? Because you know, all the stuff in the back of the fridge is was placed there first, but you never got to it unless you actually pay attention and go like, oh, I need to clean out the fridge, or I need to take all the old stuff out so that they are now in the front so that you, you consume that food first. Okay, so that's also last in, first out, but that's not how a refrigerator really should be used. But because there's only one place to put items in and one, you know, one front to you know, interface with all the content inside the refrigerator, that becomes the quote unquote the de facto standard or de facto way of accessing the fridge, unfortunately. Does that make sense so far? All right, so if you want to become a billionaire, you can start with designing refrigerators that naturally help with the first in, first out order. Like a carousel may be helpful, having two doors, so you have one door to push things in and the other door to remove items, yeah, that might actually help, okay? I think that that, that may worth some money. <laughs> and people always ask you, so if you have these billion dollar ideas, why don't you do it? Because running a company is a lot of work. Isn't it worth all the money? No, no, not really. All right, so are we okay now with the last in, first out order? I just gave you a bunch of examples. We good? Okay. Yeah, go ahead. Is this, this is still C code? Um, so what we see here is not C code. It is just a little abstract example okay. of what happens when we push and what you know, when we pop. So, uh, so let's go ahead and read this section. A push operation is what, when you add an item to a stack. In other words, you know, when, when you're at a buffet restaurant, when we get the clean dishes out of the kitchen and we put, on the, put it on the stack, that's a push operation. Okay, pushing simply means you're putting additional items on the stack. And a pop operation is when you remove things from the stack. So when a customer go to the stack of dishes and go like, okay, I need a clean plate, that's a pop, POP operation. So push and pop are actually formal terms referencing you know, the abstract operations that you can perform with a stack. I don't even care about the implementation of a stack. I'm only looking at a stack as a way to store and retrieve items. So if I were to use this notation, you know, open and square bracket, to denote the beginning and the end of a stack. Um, the beginning of the stack is always the leftmost item. That's the top of the stack, okay? So if I push 24, it becomes the only item, which means I don't really care which end is the top. But if I push 64, uh, 61 after that, then 61 becomes the one that is on the leftmost side. And if I push 11 after that, then 11 is gonna be the leftmost item. But you can also see why we use the word push, because you know, whenever we insert an item at the front, we're pushing the rest of the items to the right hand side. Does that does that make sense to you? Okay. So this is the order of how we add items to a stack. And we when we pop items or when we retrieve items, we're also removing from the same end that we push items in. Okay, just like a refrigerator. So in this case, whenever we pop, if this is the stack before we pop, when we perform a pop operation, we are retrieving the leftmost item, and then the rest of the items will shift to the left-hand side once, so that 61 now becomes the top of the stack, okay? Just think of this as a spring-loaded mechanism, 
Okay, so you know, whenever you retrieve an item, the rest will be pushed you know, back. You know, I shouldn't say pushed, but it will be spring loaded so that they all shift to the left. You know, by one item. Are we good so far? So the next pop operation will will retrieve the value of sixty one, and then we only have one item left on the stack, which is twenty four. Okay, so I'm gonna pause a little bit here and see if there are any questions about you know, this notation or the concept of last in first out. Mm -hmm. Well. This, in this case, we're only you know, storing and retrieving integers, but yes. Yep. So the most important part is the ordering of you know, how we put item in and how we retrieve items you know, in, the, in a stack. So push and pop can also be interactive. So if the stack is already just having 24 as an item, if I push 5, then it becomes 5, 24. If I push 58, then it becomes 78, 5, 24. If I pop, at this point, then it's going to retrieve the leftmost item, which is the 58, and that's why it retrieves 58 in this case. But everything else get you know kind of moved to the left hand side by one position, so the stack becomes 524. If I push again, then we have 100 you know, being the leftmost item. If I pop again, then we retrieve the item that we just pushed. So do we are we okay so far? Okay. So one thing you can do is simply to imagine every time we push. We are putting, you know, we are writing 24 on a plate and then put it on top of the stack, you know, in a, at a buffet restaurant. Every time we pop, we're simply taking the top you know, plate out of the out of the stack of dishes and look at the number on the plate itself and go like, oh, okay, I just retrieved this particular value. So if you think about it that way, you're kind of in much more physical sense, I think that should help people understand, you know, exactly what push and pop are referencing. Is that okay? Are we are we okay on the concept of last in first out or you know how a stack operates? Okay, all right. So with this all said, then we now ask, uh, so how do we do it in C plus plus? Okay, because you know, we first want to understand how to do this in C plus plus before we do it in PPP ASM. Okay, because you, we are familiar or we are supposed to be familiar with C++ at this point, at least to the point that we understand how to specify these operations. So as a data structure in C++, a stack is often implemented as a linked list of nodes. If you don't know what this is referring to, it's okay, okay? This is a concept that you will learn in CISP 430 if you have not taken that class. This is rather inefficient from the perspective of low-level code that is written in assembly, so we are not gonna do it this way. In assembly language, a stack is implement, implemented by a stack pointer and an area in RAM that is reserved for the, for the stack. The stack pointer always points to the last item on the stack. The last item on the stack is the top of the stack, okay? So the last, the stack pointer always points to the top of the stack. Yes? RAM. It is in RAM. Mm -hmm. Well, it would not, because you know, when we push an item, we are changing the content of, of the stack. And ROM in read only cannot do that. So, you know, so it has to be in that. All right. So now we are going to look at some C code. Okay, these, these are a few declarations. Um, you know, most people do not like to use your know, pound defined or macro definition these days. They can use const and e uh, stack size equals to 32, but I'm using the macro definition here. So basically these three lines combined is just you know, some code in C++ so that one, I can use a symbolic name to know how many items the stack is supposed to store. Two, I declare an array called stack which has exactly that many items. And three, I declare a stack pointer, which is a pointer to the same type of each item in the stack. Each item on the stack also has a funky name. It is uint, uint8 underscore t. 
this is basically the um, another way to specify I want an unsigned integer that is eight bit wide. Okay, so these particular strange type names are defined in standard integer dot h. Okay, as a header file. Okay, so we'll 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 see that you know pound include all that header file used in this class quite often. Okay, so from here on, when I write C code, I'll be very specific about the width of the integers. All right, so in TTP, we assume the stack is from location 255, which is the last location, to the last byte that is available after the program takes up space. So what that means is when you look at the assemble view, the very last location that is viewed, that is re referenced in column W in, um, in the assembler is the last location used by the actual program. So the next location, the location following the last location, is going to be the first available location for the stack. The stack basically uses up everything that is not used by the assembler. Okay, let me show you an example. So I can go back to the program that I just wrote, okay, and do an xclip dash cell clip and redirect. This is how I put things into the clipboard, so I can put it into the assembler. So here's the assembler, go to the source tab, get rid of everything here, and I'm just gonna copy and paste it here, okay? So however long your program is, it is still the same approach. Now this is a relatively short program. So if I need to know, you know where the stack is gonna be, I go to the assemble view. The very last location used by this program is location 09. So that means location 0A all the way to location FF are now the stack. Is that okay? So the stack size kind of depends on how much space is used by the program. If your program gets larger, you have less space for the stack. If the program is short, like this one, then you get plenty of space for the stack. So in this case, I'm using up 10 bytes for this entire program and we have 256 locations, so that means the stack actually has 246 bytes, which is pretty big. I mean, you know, we, we can do some really fun stuff with you know, recursive you know, functions with a very small stack in this class. But that's something that we'll talk about later. So does everybody understand you know, where the stack is relative to you know, what location is the last location used by the assembled program? Okay, all right, so getting back to the notes, which is here. All right, so to facilitate the efficient use of instructions, a, a stack grows down instead of up. What, does, what do we mean by that? That means the last location is used first, and then we go to the, to the front of the stack. So in this case, if I, M to initialize the stack pointer, okay? The initialization is actually here. This is how the stack pointer is initialized. So if your um, professor for, from CISP 360 did not talk about pointer arithmetic, I can explain this one. So was pointer arithmetic discussed in CISP 360? Nope, okay, I don't, I don't see a whole lot of people nodding, so I'll explain it. So let me, uh, I can use my editor here. Okay, there we go. So I'm just gonna look at a, you know, actually I'm gonna write a program, okay? I write this entire program in C. Okay, so we'll go ahead and do, a, do the same thing here. Okay, I'll just do the entire thing. So let me go to int, oh, here. This is the include file. It is called standard integer.h. So once you have this header file included, then uint 8 underscore t along with uint 8 16 32 64 underscore t as well as int 8 16 32 64 underscore t will be defined so that you can now you know, refer to integers by their width in terms of number of bits. So this has to be here, this has to be here, but everything in between is you know, things that I can now you know, define 
stack size to be 32, u in 8 underscore t is here, okay? So this is just you know, you know, allocating some space for the variable called stack, which is an array. And now I have u in 8 underscore t, asterisk sp. So sp is a stack pointer. All right. So the first thing I need to do is to initialize the stack pointer. So unfortunately, I order things in a, just a little bit out of order. So now I say sp equals to stack plus stack size. So this is what we call pointer arithmetic, because your stack, if I refer to stack by itself, it is referring to the address of the stack, because you cannot access an array by value in C++. So when you refer to the name of an array, you are actually referring to the address of the array. Okay? So this statement is actually the same thing, exactly the same as referring to the address of the first item in the stack. So it really, oh, sorry, not the first, but whatever the index is. So these two lines accomplish exactly the same thing. The second line is using the address of operator, and it is using the one element past the end of the entire you know, array and say, okay, give me the address of that one element that is past the end of the array. We know it is one element past the end because the last element of stack would have the index of stack size minus one because we count from zero. That's right. Okay. So this is referencing to an element that does not exist on the stack. We go like, isn't that a bad thing? Well, it is a bad thing only if you dereference this particular address. Just calculating the address and putting it into a pointer is not a bad thing, okay? Depending on what else we're going to do. Is that okay so far? So if you look at the stack, okay, if this is something that you might want to write down. So the way I draw memory is always, you know, up is higher memory location and pointing down is lower memory location, okay? So this is consistent, you know, with you know, the way I document you know, when I look at memory addresses. So in C++, you have actually no idea where this stack is, okay? So let's just say that this is you know, the chunk of memory that we have allocated for the stack array, okay? This is you know, location, this is uh, index zero of the stack, this is index one of the stack, and this is gonna be, this one here, is gonna be stack size minus one, because you know, that is still a part of the stack, the, the chunk of memory that we have allocated for the stack. So when we refer to stack size as an index, I'm referencing to this location here. This location here is stack, stack, S-T-A-C-K, size. Are we doing okay so far? We go like, hmm, that sounds kind of dubious because you know, we are now referencing a location that really is not a part of the stack array. Yes? Yes. Okay. So let's go ahead and you know, run this code, okay? Because you know, the best way to understand what I mean by this <laughs> is to run the code, okay? Because you know, this way you can actually see, oh, okay. So that's what we're referring to as one byte past the end of the stack, okay? So the way we can run this code, there are many ways to do it. I can do it in GDB, which is easy on this computer. I can also you know, put this you know, code into online GDB. I'll do it on online GDB because I think you, know, you guys may actually like that um, method. So I'm going to do this, you know, just kind of copy the program into my clipboard. Obviously the way you do this, you know, you, you, this is not how you work with in Windows. So if I go to onlinegdb.com, this is online GDB. You know, it does have advertisement. You know, so if you don't like the advertisement, you can go to your browser, go to extension, go to Chrome Web Store, look for some kind of a, you know, ad block. Okay, uh, the one that I use is called um, 
yes, privacy badger. Uh, oh, it's already installed, so it may not be working because I still see ads you know, here. Okay, we'll just ignore the ads for now. You know, they you, they don't have an inappropriate ads. Okay, most of the advertisement uh, target IT people, so it's not like you know, it's inappropriate, especially in a class like this. So we'll just kind of keep it that way for now. Hmm? Yeah, we'll just close you know, the ones that I can close. Okay. Won't give it, it won't close this one. Nope, doesn't look like it's one on the one to close that one too. So it depends on which ad blocker you use. You know, some may be able to block these and some may not. Um, it also depends on whether the the tool is working or not. So let me see. Okay. It is enabled for this site. And they already block a bunch, but not you know everything. Okay, it's good enough. All right. So without even signing up for an, if, without even signing up for an account, I can already do this. Okay. So if you want to use this, and you say I don't want to you know, give someone you know my you know email account or anything like that because you don't want to be spammed, you don't have to. You can just go to the website and start using it. Okay. The only downside is you cannot save your files on. Um, online GDB. But if all you're doing is editing your code from outside and pasting it into online GDB, hey, it's not a problem. Because I heard that um, Replit is starting to charge people money. So, and on top of that, okay, Replit, as far as I could tell, because I used, I tried to use it a while ago, it did not have a very good debugger for C and C++. Okay, so um, more reasons not to use it, right? So this one is actually pretty easy to use. So what I'm going to do is I will put a breakpoint here, and to place a put a, a, a breakpoint is just to kind of go to the left hand side of the line number and click it. Okay, so this is a breakpoint. Does everybody understand what a breakpoint is? Okay, very good. So we are going to run the program. So I can say debug. Okay, because without debug, it just run the program at full speed. If you're new to debugging a program, it will be helpful to know the usage of the debugger, blah, blah, blah. So it does even have online help to kind of give you some instruction of how to do it. Okay, well, that's fine, you know, because I already know how to use it. So if you debug it, it's gonna give you the debugger prompt at the bottom of the screen. You don't have to type things in using this prompt here because these buttons, okay, they give you most of the actions that you actually need to do when you're debugging a program. So if you don't feel like you're learning how to use GDB on the command line, you don't have to. But personally, I like to use GDB on the command line because it gives you a lot of things that normally you know, is not on the user interface. But that's okay, you don't have to do it. So I just start the program execution. So right now it is at the breakpoint on line nine because you can see the green kind of rectangle around your line nine. So that is telling us that the program execution has paused, okay? It's not stopped, okay? Stop means it has, the program has already completed or exited. So the program has paused at this point. And you can also see that, you know, we can see what is on the stack, okay? But it doesn't interpret it very you know, correctly, but it basically says, you know, we have 31 bytes of zeros, okay? 32 bytes because you know, this is the first one and then it repeats you know, 31 times. The stack pointer also has a value of zero because it's not initialized, it can be anything, okay? If you have a local variable that is not initialized, it really can't have any value because it is uninitialized. So I'm gonna single step through this code here, which means you know, I can use, I really can use either step over or step into. The difference is when, if the line that I'm dropping in here is a call to a function, then it makes a difference. If I'm calling a function on this line, stepping into means I'm single stepping into the function being called. So it would go into the function, pause, so that I can single step through the function being called. If I know the function is doing something that's correctly already, I don't want to spend my time single step through you know, the, the function being called, then I can use the step over. But this line does not have any function call, so it really does not make any difference which one I click. So I can click step over, 
So now we have you know, the stack pointer initialized, which is seven FFFF, a bunch of Fs. The only the last two digits is actually relevant to us in this class, so it is a three zero in hexadecimal. So now I need to do something with the uh, GDB interface because, well, I suppose I can do it here too. I can display expressions, okay. So I can now ask, okay, tell me where is the last item of the stack? So that would be stack size minus one and it doesn't show the value. Okay, well, if, if it doesn't work this way, I can always you know, do a print in, over here. So I can say print the address of stack, stack size minus one. Stack size is not defined because it's a macro, but I know what stack size is, so it's a 32. So we'll just you know, change it to a 32. That's the only problem with a macro. Um, it's hard for you to read this because it is um, kind of inverted, but you can, for those of you who can't see it, this ends with a QF. In other words, the location of the last item in the, in the stack as, a, as an array ends with an address of 2F, but the stack pointer is initialized to something that ends with 30. So that is what I said, that's what I meant when I said the stack pointer is initialized to one location past the end of the last item of the array. Is that okay so far? Okay, all right. So now we go like, okay, so the initialization of the first line did this. What about the second line? Okay, so we're gonna single step through the second line. So observe this value here and see whether it changes when I single step through the program. Step over, it's the same. So that is a validation to show you that line nine and line 10, they accomplished exactly the same thing, which also means the expression here, okay, which is use a, using pointer arithmetic is the same as this expression here, which is using the more conventional, but a little bit more clumsy way of referencing a particular element of an array and take the address of that. Are we good so far? All right, okay. So now the next question is, um, so we are just initializing the stack pointer, but how do we push and how do we pop items in this case? So I'm stopping the execution of the program because I need to go back to the uh, discussion here. Yep. Uh, just to step back a little bit, for the stack, the code, you were basically just displaying the actual index. You were adding extra elements in there, is that right? We are not, we are just, we are only initializing the stack pointer. So basically the, the thing that we saw in online GDB is what happens when the stack is empty. Okay, when the stack is empty, the stack pointer points one location past the end of the chunk of memory that we allocate for the stack. Okay, so that's kind of important, okay? You know, we are only initializing right now. In other words, at this point, okay, if I were to document this, this is an empty stack, which I use the open and close bracket to represent, okay? So now we want to say, okay, I want to push something. In fact, let's go back and you know, be consistent with our uh, module over here. So let's just say the first thing we want to push is 24, okay? So the question now is, how do I push 24? So I need to do two things because I have a very poor short-term memory. So I have to write down what I need to do. And then I switch back to the lecture material to look at generally how do we push something. There's a sequence of code to push something. This is the sequence of code to push something. We first decrement the stack pointer. And then we say, oh, okay, now use that stack pointer to point to whatever the stack pointer is pointing to. Now we store whatever value we want to store at that location. Is that okay? So we decrement the stack pointer first, then we store. Are we good so, or not? We good? Okay. So in the uh, C code, 
Okay, I will do exactly the same thing. In fact, I'm going to do a copy and paste. Okay, so we'll say, um, why, how come there's an empty space here? That's because I did not remove the mouse pointer to close enough to that. Okay, so I'm just going to do a paste here. Oh, so V, it's a paste. And we know what value we want to push, which is 24. That's how we push an item on the stack. So immediately the first question is, why isn't this a bad thing? We are overwriting a location that is not a part of the stack array. Or am I actually okay in this case? What do you think? Am I okay or am I gonna end up with a problem because I'm writing to a location that is not really a part of the array? I'm okay because I pre-decrement the stack pointer. So by the time I get to line 14, the stack pointer really is pointing to the very last location of the stack or the array that I allocate for the stack you know, variable, okay? But don't take my words for it, right? So what we're gonna do is to put another breakpoint here and I'll move this breakpoint to right here so that we can compare the stack pointer and also the content on the stack from both locations, okay? So we'll go ahead and uh, debug the program again. There we go. Click debug, click start. This is on the first line. So the stack pointer is this at this location. This is before we do the decrement, okay? So it is at location three, zero. And then the stack being uninitialized has a bunch of stuff in it, which is okay, okay? You know, it doesn't really matter what stuff it has because we have not put a single thing on the stack yet on line 13. By the time we get to line 13, I should say. So now we just you know, say, okay, if you don't need to single step and you just want to continue execution at full speed, you just click continue. So clicking continue means you know, it either the program will get to the exit entirely and the program says I'm done, or it will get to the next breakpoint if there's another breakpoint along the path to the end of the execution. So I just click continue here, and now the stack pointer is ending with 2F, and um, it points to the very last thing that we push on the stack. So the last thing that we push on the stack is backslash zero, three, zero. You go like, that's the wrong thing. I mean, I thought we pushed your 24. You go like, okay, wait, maybe this is in hexadecimal. No, 24 in hexadecimal is what? It is 16 plus, Eight, so it is one eight, okay? So 24 is one eight in hexadecimal or base 16. So what is this you know, zero, three, zero here? One thing you can also do is to go to the uh, prompt, you know, go to the command line portion of uh, GVB and just ask what is at the last location of the stack. So the stack has 32 items. The last location has an index of 31. And it prints like this. It's like, yep, it is 24, but it also gives you the same you know, notation here, which is backslash 030. Zero, zero. In C, if you prefix a number you know, with a zero, it becomes a base eight number. Okay, can you say that one more time? In C, as a convention, when you specify an integer, if the number starts with a zero, obviously, other than floating point numbers, if it starts with a zero, it means the rest is a base eight number. So if it's a base eight number, does it make sense? Well, let's see. In the base eight number, this is telling me how many ones we have, none. This is telling me, telling me how many eights we have, which is three. Wait, three times eight is 24. So it does work out, okay? So I'm just teaching you guys how to read you know, in base eight or octal number in this case. All right, cool. Um, so this is, in fact, a location that is valid in the stack. But what about the stack pointer? The stack pointer points to the very last thing that we push on the stack. That was the last thing that we push on the stack. So everything is cool. Is that okay? All right. So now we're going to do the other pushes you know, that were referred to in the module. Okay, so you know, it means you know, we are just doing these experiments here. We're gonna push 64, I think 11, and so on. 
This is starting to get a little cumbersome, so I'm going to use a macro definition to help speed up the process. Yes, go ahead. Well, you cannot have 1,000 something because, okay, so let's go back to the program and see what kind of value we can actually store to each member or each element in the array. What is the type of each item in the array? It's an 8-bit unsigned integer. So that means in decimal in base 10, what is the range of value that I can store at each location? from zero to 255, because 255 is two to the power of eight minus one, okay? So this goes back to how we can calculate the range of values that can be stored in integers. And when did we talk about that? Signed versus unsigned, okay? So, so this, the, 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 the complexity of this class comes from the fact that almost everything chain to everything else in the class. The only exception to that rule are double floating point numbers. Those are the only things that has quote unquote a dead end, <laughs> which means by the time we are done talking about it and by the time the exam has a question about it, it's done, okay? But almost everything else has a continuous chain to you know, a long line of connection between the topics. And that's, you know, I think that really adds to you know, why this class is more difficult than many of your other classes because you know, the topics do not just kind of cluster. Okay, this is a bunch of topics, this is a bunch of topics, and the, be, between the clusters, there are very few relationships. In this class, the entire class is a huge mesh where everything interconnects. Okay, so keeping track of all of that is can be challenging, but taking notes can help. Okay, having your own representation of how those concepts relate to each other can be helpful. Okay, so I'm gonna stop the program because I'm gonna use a feature in C++, so this is not gonna be in your exam, but it is nonetheless you know, something that you probably want to understand even though it is not important. Macros can be more than just a number. In this case, I can define a macro that I say push, that I can say push, P-U-S-H, there we go. And we'll take a parameter. And the way you define this particular macro is simply to specify the statement that you need to um, implement your push. So in this case, we can say sp minus minus semicolon, uh, the reference sp equals to x, and then another semicolon. So I can base, so the way macro works is it is just an expansion of however the, the macro is defined. It is not a function. It is a very simple expansion <coughs> of the template that we define as a macro. It has some downfalls, okay, because the debugger actually does not understand the macros. This is all done uh, what, you know, with what we call a C preprocessor, okay? So, and the debugger do not see anything after, oh, excuse me, before the C preprocessor. So all the macro definition are not accessible from the debugger's perspective, okay? But from the being handy perspective, this is actually super handy because now if I need to push the next thing on the stack, I just say push. Ah, okay, cannot type, there we go, push. Uh, what was it that we need to push? 61 and then 11, okay. So 61, oops. 61 and push 11. I don't even need a semicolon at the end because the semicolon is included as a part of the template. So that's you know, kind of, it's just a you know, expansion of the macro you know, here. So we'll go ahead and test whether this works or not. Might as well also use this you know, for pushing the 24. So we have push 24 and then comment out this code here. Okay, so we'll just kind of comment out this code. And then we'll see what happens with this program. And I have to move my breakpoint a little bit because you know, everything got shifted a little bit here. So let me put one here, put one here, put one here, and then put one here. 
So when I get to these breakpoints, the first breakpoint will show me an empty stack. The second breakpoint will give me the stack after I click 24. And then the second, the third breakpoint will show me after we got two items pushed. And then the last breakpoint will show me after all three items are pushed. Okay. So this is some, something that you can also do, okay? Because online GDB is just a web page. It's just a URL. So that means even if you're using a Chromebook, you can still do this, okay? All right, so let's go ahead and debug the program. And then we click Start. We take a note of uh, what is the stack pointer pointing to. It is pointing at the location ending with three zero. Continue. Now it is pointing to a location uh, ending with 2F, and the very last item is 030, which is our 24. Because you know, when you look at the content of the stack, it says it starts with a 000, which is a long character. We haven't initialized you know, that particular location. It can be anything. But the very last location has the content of 030, which is an octal number for 24. So when we uh, continue this program's execution, uh, this is our second, this is after we push 24, but before we push 61, this is after we push 61. So what is happening to the stack? The stack pointer is now decremented by one again to a 2E, ending with 2E, and there are two, uh, that is not correct because it doesn't show that we have, oh, okay, it is an equal. <laughs> it's printing it as character, unfortunately, because the debugger is trying to be a smarty pants and say, oh, 8-bit you know, integers, you mean characters. So I will help you interpret everything as character, okay? Because the ASCII code of equal to is 61 in decimal. You go like, how do we know that? Well, you can, you can test it. You can go to the debugger and simply say print uh, the character of equal to, and that's what it gives you. It has a ASCII code of 61, but when you print it out as a character, it is the equal sign. Is that okay? All right. All right, so that accounts for, okay, so this is the last, this is the first item that we push, this is the second item that we push, but which one are we pointing at? Now, it looks like it's pointing to the 0130, but that's not the case it is actually pointing to the equal to because it's interpreting the whole thing as a string, okay? So the way the stack pointer is displayed is it is interpreting the stack pointer as a string, and so it is printing out the equal to and then the 24 you know, on the stack. Yep. Zero three zero is 24 because zero three zero is an octal number, it's a base eight number. The 61 is interpreted as a character. It is tur it turns out to be the same as the equal symbol. Now, if you want to print out you know, those things you know, as an actual unsigned number, you can do something like this, okay? You can just you know, cast it to unsigned and then refer to the location. So we're looking at stack you know, 31 as the last item. It is 24. And then we look at the second last item, which is at index 30. And it is indeed 61. So you can use the print statement also to force it to print it only as a base 10 number. We good so far? Is that okay? I still don't understand like the, so the zero, when I, because I, I copied the entire program on my computer, uh -huh. and every time I step through it, it still says zero, zero, so I don't know what that says. It's, zero. okay, it says three, zero, three, zero, because it is the last item, but it has an equal to, you know, before it now. The equal sign as a character has an ASCII code of 61 in decimal. In oh, other I words, hmm? okay. And because it is interpreted as a string, so that means whatever location is after this turns out to be a null character because otherwise it would have printed some you know, funky stuff too. The backslash. So the backslash means you know, we are dealing with a character that is not printable. And as a, as a result, it would use an octal number to represent the ASCII code. That's what the backslash is trying to tell you. 
So there are non-printable characters, and 24 is one of the non-printable characters because it's a control, it's a control thing. You know, um, control A is ASCII one, so control so 24 is the third to the last letter in the English alphabet. So we have Z, Y, and X. So control X on the keyboard will have the ASCII code of 24. All righty. So those are those are very good questions. Okay. So are we are we good so far? Yeah, yeah. Okay. All right. So we will finish this one. You know, eleven. So as it turns out, eleven is also a non-printable character. But certain non-printable characters are not displayed using backslash and three digits in octo, because there are actual standard ways to display those. So we'll see what this how this one is going to be displayed. Okay. So this one is displayed as backslash V instead of backslash, in this case, you know, 11 in octo would be 0, 0, oh, wait, 0, 1, 3, okay? 0, 1, 3 would be the octo number for 11, what we know as 11, but instead of using backslash 0, 1, 3, it is using backslash V because this is the, the character at ASCII code 11 is known as the vertical tab character. Don't ask me. To. Okay. So a little bit more kind of backtracking here. Okay. So I want to show you the ASCII table. Oh, by the way, what does ASCII represent? You guys never talked about this in C++? Okay. ASCII is American Standard Code for information interchange. That is ASCII, okay? All it really is, is a standardization of what bit pattern represents what character, okay? So you would think, oh, that means everything on the keyboard and no more than that. Well, that's not the case. So when you look up the ASCII table, it is actually kind of complicated. So let's look at the ones that we were just talking about, which is 11 in decimal. This is in the decimal column. This is 11. It is called the vertical tab. And tab itself is ASCII code number nine. Carriage return is number 13. Uh, nope, not here. 13 is here. This is carriage return. Line feed is 10. This is line feed. So the question is, what the heck? Are these things? <clears throat> well, you have to remember the days when you people use what we call teletype terminal. So, what is a teletype terminal? Well, the easiest way is to look it up. Okay, you know, what is a teletype terminal? And that's also why your TTY is the abbreviation of teletype. Okay, you know, it's teletype terminal. Okay. And look for images, okay? Because we like to look at pictures, okay? This is a teletype terminal. You go like, oh, you mean a typewriter? No, it's a teletype terminal. <laughs> what is the difference? A typewriter or electric typewriter is one where you are the only source of what the typewriter is going to type. A teletype terminal is what we call a tele typewriter. What does tele mean? What is the root? What does the root tally mean in? I think it's a Greek root. Okay, think about what all the other terms with tally in it. Tally skull, tally phone, right? Distance. Distance, exactly. Okay, so tally type means something remotely can specify what content is typed on the paper that you have on the roller. Okay. Has anyone used an actual typewriter ever in your life? Okay, we have some people nodding, okay, and probably a bunch of people saying, nope, have never even seen one, okay? So on a regular typewriter, there are keys or mechanical components that will allow you to roll the paper by itself without typing anything. That is line feed, okay? Line feed means rotating the roller by one line. So you move on to the next line, but without moving the carriage. You go like, what carriage are we talking about? Okay. 
So when you're printing or when you're typing something on a piece of paper, there is quote unquote the carriage. The carriage is the mechanism that can strike on the piece of paper and therefore you're, you're printing or imprinting the character on the piece of paper with an ink uh, written in between, okay? So when, you, when you're actually typing, if that carriage is not moving, that means you will be printing on the same location, okay? That's not gonna be helpful. So after you type three characters, the carriage has to move on to the next location. You type another character, then move on to the next location and so on. So carriage return refers to, oh, we are at the very end of the typewriter. The carriage cannot go any further. And I need to go on to the next line. Okay, that's a line feed, okay? But line feed by itself is not gonna help you because the carriage is still all the way to the right hand side because you're done with the previous line. So carriage return is moving the carriage all the way back to the left hand side so it can start on the next line. So on an actual typewriter, in order to finish a line, what we think as, oh, we just need to end the line. Okay, in C++, how do you, how do you specify the end of a line? Endo, exactly, which stands for end line, okay? So end line, which is used in C++, okay, using C out, is actually translating on an actual typewriter. It, it converts to carriage return and the line feed. Because one controls the vertical movement, the roller, and then the other one controls the horizontal movement, which is the carriage return. Is that okay? So ver vertical tab, okay, which is control V, is, con no, it's not control V, it's uh, 11, so that makes it what? A, B, C, D, E, F, G, H, I, J, K. Control K on the keyboard is vertical tab, which means roll the roller a number of times. Instead of once, it's gonna move it multiple times. Just like a tab, a normal tab, it's multiple spaces, a vertical tab is rotating the roller multiple times. So that's how these characters are coming from because of the root of where, you know, how terminals operate from long ago. So is that okay? Does everybody kind of get an idea of what these things are talking about? Okay, because we have startup headings, startup text, you know, all of these are basically only useful for teletype terminals. But because everything that we have today are derived from teletype terminals, so they are still quote unquote useful. There's one for Bell, okay? You look at the ASCII code number seven. The document for this one is Bell. What do you think it corresponds to on a typewriter? A bell. A bell, exactly. Ding. That's what it is. So if you type you know, this letter on a keyboard, what do you think you would expect back? Or if you try to print it out, what do you expect? The computer makes a sound. Ding, just like that. Yeah, yeah, so fun, fun stuff, fun stuff. And there's also a form feed. Form feed is, where's form feed? It's usually, um, it's usually abbreviated as FF right here. So form feed is going to the next page. All righty, so kind of interesting stuff, you know, because of the historical background. But I think sometimes it is, it's actually important to talk about the historical background because without understanding the background, these things are just like, I have no idea what that means. What is acknowledge? I mean, acknowledge is a character that you send back to the sender of the original message and say that, yep, I got it. Okay, so that's what the act or acknowledge is about. Because when you're dealing with teletype you know, communication, you know, and you want to make sure that the teletype device got the actual message, that's how they can communicate. This is how they can uh, control S and control Q. They also have special names. You know, one is to pause and one is to resume your transmission. Um, so what is control S? Control S is A, B, C, D, E, F, G, H, I, J, K, L, M, N, O, P, Q, R, S, 19. So 19 is device control three, which is control S. This is how you can pause something. It still works on the dumb terminal. If you have a Mac, 
uh, if you go to terminal, if you have Linux, you go to terminal. If you have Windows, you can go to the command line interface. If your program is printing out a bazillion things and you're like, I cannot read this fast, control S will pause. Okay, control Q will resume you know, the, the text output. All right, so getting back to uh, all the boring stuff that we are talking about in today's lecture. So when we go back to this program, it has timed out already, which is fine. Um, are we doing okay so far with this? Okay, so now we can look at, you know, pop, you know, we are almost running out of time, but I want to finish this. So I'm going to define pop, you know, which does not involve, you know, a parameter. Pop is going to um, basically print out whatever is popping because otherwise, you know, I need something to show me what it is printing. So I'm going to include um, standard IO so I can use printf. So what this is going to do is we are going to printf and format the string as percent %u um, and then we typecast it to unsigned what the stack point is pointing to. So now we are going like, um, we need to, okay, if you go back to what we need to do, which is in the module, how do we pop something? The sequence to pop something are these two statements. So it is exactly the reverse of how we put it in every way possible, okay? So if you compare these two lines of code, which is for popping, and you compare these two lines of code, which is for pushing, they are exact opposite in every possible way. First of all, SP minus minus becomes SP plus plus. But SP minus minus was done first, SP plus plus was done last, okay? In pushing, we are using a value to change what the stack pointer points to. When we pop, we retrieve whatever the stack point is pointing, and then we, some make, use, we make some use of it. Okay? So it is the opposite in every possible way. Okay? All the directions are reversed. So in the program in uh, GDB, I'm going to specify that as um, this is just you know, printing out whatever the stack pointer points to. But before this, I also need to increment the stack pointer because, oh, I, after that, I'm sorry, I take it back. We have to do this after. There we go. So that's how we specify a pop operation and also print it out to the screen at the same time. Um, I also need a backslash n. So backslash n is called new line, which in Unix is already sufficient to specify, you know, termination of new line. In some computers, you also need uh, backslash n is new line, which is also the same thing as line p. It's a carriage, I mean, a ASCII code 10 in decimal. All right, so now we can say, let's push, let's pop a few items, okay? We'll pop two of these, okay? So we specify pop, we specify pop, and then we'll see what the program does, okay? This time I'm gonna remove all the uh, breakpoints, okay? Because I just need to look at the output, the, the actual text output of the program. So we go to debug. I don't really need to go to debug, but we go to debug. And this is the actual output. It outputs that the first item that we retrieve is 11. The second one is 61. Is that the correct answer? Yep. So you can, re you can basically finish up this program with the rest of the program, okay? So if you want to get a better understanding of how push and how pop works, you can go ahead and finish the program. Um, the nice, the other nice thing about online GDB is I can sign in as myself, then I can save this file, and then I can also share a link to this file. So let me show you how that, what I mean by that. So I need to first sign in, log in here. Uh, all right, I'll be safe. <laughs> copy everything first. I think it does re retain what I have here. So we'll go ahead and read. And then we go to sign in. I think I'm using Google Plus. I'm not sure. No, maybe not. That's okay. Now I'm signed in. Oh, it did re remove everything. That's okay. I got all, everything already saved. Control A, Control V. Now I got everything back. And I can now save the file. So I can go to, I have to create a project first. God, 
Hi. Now I can save it. So I can now save. Okay, how do I? Top of the screen. Oh, okay, right here. Okay. <laughs> oh, that's saving to local. Yeah, that, that's not saving remotely. Go up a little bit right now. Oh, upload. Yeah. Oh, there would. Okay. To the right, more next to the yellow share button up there. Oh, that's a weird place to save. Okay, so we'll call this one the push pop. Okay, and the destination is my projects. I can select destination. Okay, well, I mean, that's fine. Save, and now I can share with the rest of the class. Okay, this is the other cool part of using online GDB is instead of using the announcement and putting attachment over there, I can now just you know, copy and paste this and just put it into the announcement for this class. Then you guys can all have access to this program. So go to announcement, add an, 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 add an announcement, go like, you know, this is the push pop C program. Just put a link here, that's all I need. Publish. So even if you do not have an account, I believe this link still works. So let me double check it. Okay, I go create an incognito window and then put the link in. So this means you know, I'm not signed in yet. And there we go, we have the program. So you can now take this program and do whatever you want with it, okay? You can continue the testing or you know, test, you know, play with it in online GDB. You can put it back into VS Code if that's your, your preferred environment. You can copy and paste this into VS Code. If you like code blocks, okay, you can put it into code blocks. Or if, you, or if you're using a Mac and you want to say, I want to use Xcode, okay, put it into Xcode. But the program is yours to play with now. Okay, so I hope this helps you, you know, understand what is pushing and what is popping. Okay, if anyone is having the question of, but what does this have anything to do with calling and returning? Well, read the module, okay? You will find out exactly why you know, this is useful because what we'll be pushing and we'll, what we'll be pushing and popping is called the return address. Every time you call a function, you push the return address on the stack. And then when the subroutine, when the function is done, it will pop the return address. So the stack becomes a communication medium between the caller and the function being called, okay? So that really is the significance of this entire discussion, is we are setting up the concept of a stack because it is gonna be useful for pushing and call, for uh, calling and returning from a subroutine, but the same mechanism is also useful to put all of your local variable as well as all the parameters. In other words, just about everything that we do that requires your storing and retrieving something is on the stack. So that is the significance of the concept of a stack. And that's why this becomes super important <coughs> before we move on to actually talk about you know, how to call and how to return. All right, so I know we are running out of time you know, for the lecture. I will stop the recorder.